Score, the podcast. The only show taking you inside the studios of the world's most celebrated composers and musical storytellers. Presented by Spitfire Audio. I'm Kenny Holmes. I am still very happily Robert Kraft. You ever go by Bob? Once. Somebody called me Bob, but... I hesitate to share what happened to that person. Um, you left him so, bobbing in the water I, well, somewhere? You know, Sopranos Jeff, what you, I have been known to be Rob, perfectly fine, and I grew up as Robbie, which Robbie, I thought that's it. Was, very, was very sweet. But when I you know, started my band in New York, the idea of Robbie Kraft sounded like I was 11 years old. So um, Robert was slightly uncomfortable, but has worked. <laughs> Carol, have you always been Carol? Um, come on, Carol. Any other? I guess. Come on, good give. morning. Nicknames? Um, Nicknames? That, good morning. Like composer Carol? I um, love that. I don't know. I, in, I, in Indonesian, my Indonesian friends, they call me Ker. Like with the rolled R. Yeah. Wait, did you say Ker Ker? Oh, that's, you, you, you realize today? that you just changed your name on the show. Really? Oh, that, that's oh, yeah. kind of butchering it, but I, I'll take it. <laughs> I'm okay, trying. Well, I'm trying. It, it's well, I'm still there. Kenny, so I guess I'm 11. Robert, thanks. Uh, um, that's so nice. I'm I not like going Kenny. Ken. Nice. Uh, but anyway, I digress. Kenneth this is Score the Podcast, and it is Big presented show. by Spitfire Audio. Uh, that's Robert Kraft. That's composer Carol. Uh, good morning to you guys, and um, we're very excited about our show mm-hmm. today. We have a big guest. Um, in the very first season of this show, we had his brother on, Harry Gregson Williams. Of course, we're talking about Rupert Gregson Williams. You know his music Ruby. from Wonder Woman, Aquaman, Hawk, Hacksaw Ridge, Veep, Catch-22, Behind Her Eyes, and plenty more. I think of he course, scored like The Crown, 20, which is oh, kind of awesome. Yeah. And like 20 Adam Sandler comedies um, that are stretch all over Netflix and yep. um, pretty much any Adam Sandler film in the last couple of decades aside from uh, uncut gems i think uh, rupee yeah. as we like to call him here in the behind the scenes rupert has uh, scored um, those films so we're excited to talk to rupert he's joining us from the uk um so another opportunity to talk to a composer from overseas which this whole virtual uh setup we have has given us the opportunity to talk to so many people around the world so we're very excited about that we're going to get to rupert gregson williams in just a bit but first we want to take a moment to thank our sponsor spitfire audio maker of orchestral sample libraries for film composers whether you're just starting out or a seasoned professional spitfire has so many sounds you will love you know they release a new library in their free lab series every month and uh, you can get the entire orchestra for free. I mean, what such a deal. It's the BBC Symphony Orchestra Discover Edition. At the end of this episode, you're going to hear a demo of the really cool package called Albion Solstice. Yes, it's a sweet, sweet package. Um, here's, here's a little uh, write-up about it. A celebration of unnoted traditions passed down through generations Inspired by our rich and varied musical heritage, Albion Solstice is a wellspring of opportunities featuring strings, bass, and woodwind, accompanied by unique instruments from Nickel Harpa, which is the spelling of that. I've never seen it spelled out before. Nickel Harpa. Uh, Celtic fiddles, hurdy-gurdy, and modern synthesizers, percussion performances, and much more. This is not a library to create folk music with, but simply everything you need to create cinematic scores for today, inspired by the past. The demo cue will really spell that out for you guys. And also, I want to note, if you aren't uh, signed up yet on our Patreon show, More Score, we had an awesome conversation with Christian and Paul, the creators of Spitfire, and they talk about how this whole company started. And it's pretty mind-blowing. It was never intended to be what it is. It was a couple of composers trying to create some cool sounds. It became sort of a, a secret society of film score uh, sounds and samples, and it spread around like wildfire, and everyone wanted to get their hands on it. And next thing you know, 
they're in high demand to create these libraries. And that's a very, very shortened version of the story, but it involves an, a volcano erupting that almost shut the whole thing down. And I, I'll, let's wow. just leave it at that. Um, more score over on Patreon. Uh, we have exclusive interviews you won't get here on the show. And when this season wraps up, we're getting close. It's year round. So you're going to be able to get content all throughout the year from us and uh, hear from great composers as well as uh, other people in the field. Um, you know, mixers, uh, Peter Rotter, your conversation with the orchestra booker, really interesting stuff that gives you an idea of how all this industry works. Um, Robert, I know that you're trying to have a chat with the uh, World Soundtrack Awards people as well. That might be an interesting conversation. I am um, proudly a member of the World Soundtrack Awards board. And that's my humble brag, but uh, I've been on that board for many years because I really love the work they do. Yeah. Um, plus, of course, if I'm lucky enough to get to Ghent, Belgium, which is a medieval city, a beautiful city. I want to go. I can't wait. Oh, the World Soundtrack Awards are this week-long celebration of film music, and it always culminates in the award show at the end of the week. And this year, um, still, I think, unclear whether it will be in person, virtual, or a hybrid, because it's in October, so hopefully by October, which is not that far away, things will be a little clearer. But they've just yeah. announced... Wait, wait, full- before we get to that, though, Shoot. I was just uh, we were just talking about more score, and I was, I was bragging about uh, our really fun conversation with Paul and Cri- Christian uh, from Spitfire. But we didn't tell you about the promo code. Uh, as always, score the podcast. You're right. We give you a promo code exclusive to our listeners for your first order of Spitfire products, 25% off... All you have to do is enter the promo code SCORE2021 at checkout. Again, you can use it for uh, Albion Solstice, uh, the Hammers package you heard from last week, and um, so many more. There's the Hans Zimmer strings and uh, drums, I think, as well. And there's, there's, I think, almost 100 libraries on there that you can use this promo code on if it's your first order. Um, so go online and use it because when this season ends, the promo code also ends at some point, and we don't want you to miss out on the opportunity to get that savings. Exclusive to you, our score of the podcast listeners. It's really a great deal. 25% off your first order. I personally, if I could, would order everything they have and get the 25% off. And But you've already ordered, so you blew it. I know. I'm too late. I've done it. But I also, since I have already gotten to be part of the Spitfire family, I get those free lab downloads. They just send it to you. So that's another benefit. Um, yep. And Don't feel I too do- special, though, because those are free. Anyone can get those. So go on there. If you haven't gotten those yet, get on there and, and get them. Robert's not like a VIP. Anyone can get those. Mm-mm. And so Don't feel too special, Robert. <laughs> yeah, quit, quit trying to make it sound like you're behind some velvet rope with the lab series. <laughs> I may not be a VIP, but I'm a VIPH. Do you know what that is? Uh oh. I'm a very important podcast host. Oh, okay. wow. I thought Actually, there was a, like a bad dad joke coming there. And I'm, I was a, I'm a VIPCH, a very important uh, podcast co host. There we go. Wow. See? So I'm, these I'm A blocks. Ooh, I just want to just, apologize to Kar right now for. Uh, having to put up with us this morning. Car. Car. I do. Car. No so, uh, as I was saying, yeah, the so World let's Soundtrack get to, Awards. Let's get to the World Soundtrack Awards because the nominations Great nominations are this year. And I just want to say quite wonderfully, if you look down these incredible list, down this incredible list of composers, most of them have been our guests. And the yeah. ones that haven't will be our guests. Yeah, so we're in touch. We are certainly in the middle of this community. Kenny, you want to tell us the, first of all, give us a little shout out to the guest of honor. Oh, the guest of honor. One of our favorite guests from last season, Max Richter, um, who I, my vinyl library has grown drastically with Max Richter uh, stuff. Not not just his film scores, but um, his, his artist work too, which, which is just it's the perfect music to just throw on and 
get things done, whether you're relaxing or wanting to get some work done or something like that. Uh, he's just, he's a master. Um, yeah. So Emotional he he's composer. the guest of honor this year, which is a great honor. Um, so many past guest of honors are, are some really, really big names in uh, the field. Um, but then we have the film composer of the year category, um, which is loaded. Uh, Nanita Desai, who we're in touch with. We're trying to get her on. Um, this season, I know we've been dealing with some scheduling things, and she's also in London. Um, but American Murder, The Family Next Door, which is a documentary that she scored for Netflix that is fantastic, and it's a it's a tragic story about a family in Colorado. Um, but it, her music really, really hit the mark there. Um, and then she also had that another great documentary, The Reason I Jump, which has gotten so much love. Uh, another nominee, James Newton Howard, another uh, alum of the show, um, News of the World, Raya and the Last Dragon were the films that he's up for for that year. But he also has Jungle Cruise out this year. Um, and did he do something else this year? I'm trying to remember off the top of my head. I'm going to say yes, but we most will get likely, back to you. he's a legend. Yes. James Thank Newton you. Howard, uh, Emil Mosseri, who's uh, who made an appearance on the show last year as well with Kajillionaire and Minari. Uh, Minari was uh, Oscar nominated, um, fantastic, and he's really just the future. I mean, Emil is killing it. Uh, Daniel Pemberton, Enola Holmes, Rising Phoenix, and The Trial of Chicago Seven. Another big year. He's also nominated for uh, Song of the Year as well uh, for Trial of the Chicago Seven. Um, yeah. Just a really talented and and inventive and creative composer and then uh the obvious trent reznor atticus ross and john batiste for soul which won the oscar uh this past year for best score why don't you tell us the tv composer of the year category tv composers are all just so cool and uh four of the five have been on the show and are great friends of ours we got christoph beck for wandavision Mm -hmm. a very strong contender we have our close personal friend, Nick Bertel, Respect. for the Underground Respect. Railroad. Nicholas working again with Barry Jenkins, who he scored two of his films. Mm-hmm. Oh, big shout out, by TV the way, show. Succession coming back very <gasps> soon. Can't wait. I can't wait. The remarkable and magical Ludwig Goranson for season two of The Mandalorian, uh, which is a strong contender. Then we have this very interesting composer, Natalie Holt, who's getting a lot of love for Loki, which yes. she scored. And we hope, Natalie, if you're out there listening, you'll come on Score the Podcast. Yes, please. We hope soon and, and tell us your story. And then Carlos Rafael Rivera for Hacks and the Queen Gambit. I know he's made an appearance. So that's strong. Yeah. I think. The best the conversation with Carlos is over on More Score now. That's if you haven't right. heard that, uh, his, his backstory again. I, I'm just so inspired by these composers and what they go through to get to where they're at. And you know, he was working and and scoring things all throughout. And and, and then you just sometimes you just get on a show that really fits you and you just knock it out of the park. And the Queen's Gambit is so good. And Carlos is such a great dude. Go check that episode out too. Hey, Carol, do you want to tell us a couple best original songs? <laughs> Come on, jump you guys in are there. The oh, her video just... froze. Oh, really? She froze. What? Carol, Carol, are you okay? No, oh, I'm trying to oh. bail you out. You, it didn't work. Oh, Oh yeah, my internet's dropping frames. Oh, oh, oh. oh no! Oh, we I guess Kenny you going through the canyon. All right, I'll do it. Uh, right. Best original song: Crawl, "Call Me Cruella" um, by Florence Welch, Jordan Powers, Nicholas Bertel, Steph Jones, and Tora Simpson. "Fight for You," Judas and the Black Messiah. Believe I believe that won the Academy Award this year. It sure by, did. Yeah, by her. Yeah. Uh, Dernst, Emil, and Tiara Thomas. That's a big songwriting crew, and they nailed it. Uh, boy, the wonderful song that Daniel wrote with this new artist, Celeste Waitia, who uh, called Hear My Voice. She's mm-hmm. actually, Daniel, of course, killing it, but Celeste is kind of a bright new star in the UK, a vocalist. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Do you know H- this one, Kenny? Husevic, this was a comedy. This is the Will yep. Ferrell uh Comedy about the the music festival, right? Yeah, Eurovision. Yeah, and uh, that is Savan Kotecha, Ricard Goranson, and Fat Max Seuss. Um, there you go. And then 
the final one is Lo- Loyal Brave True uh, from Mulan, which is Jamie Hartman. Uh, the brother of our guest today, Harry Gregson Williams, Rosie Golan, and Billy Crabtree. Uh, oh, exactly. I'm sorry. There's one more. And then uh, Rain Song by Emil Mosseri uh, from Minari. So a, a lot of double dippers there. Um, getting some love on the song category and the uh, composing action. Uh, Just so, before yeah, we... I was going to say, they haven't they haven't announced yet if that's in person, right? Yeah. You, no, you mentioned I, I kind of was hoping... I went two years ago before COVID knocked it out of a live show and it was wonderful i mean the concerts first of all of course we're huge film music fans but seeing film music performed in europe is a new experience because they love it they are ferocious about it the theaters are sold out during this entire festival for the concert because people come from all over to hear great film music performed it's very and that's a that's pretty consistent throughout europe that film music has a very important place in the canon and it, the stature of film composers is elevated so going to this festival is fun just because yeah. everybody gets so much respect I well and they do a you, lot of q and a's and stuff too right yeah, it's not just great, great stuff uh, one yep. night of award show because uh, aside from the oscars i'm trying to think of somewhere else where you know the Oscars will will have like songs and stuff performed throughout the show that are nominated, but we're talking about here the biggest collective group of film and TV composers who are performing, doing Q and A's, and this is their night. They're not part of what's bigger to come at the end of the night. This is their big collection. Right. Yeah, absolutely right. It's actually almost entirely their week because there's so many events during the week. I want to ask one final question, and I think we could have answers sent to us, anybody who has thoughts on this, but I've always wondered, does this still hold? They say it's an honor to be nominated. Do you feel, listeners, that just being among the nominees is a great honor, or are you all about If you don't get the gold medal, then you're just not a winner. I leave that question hanging in the air before we go to our A block. I have some thoughts on it, none of which I'm at liberty to share because I haven't fully formed them. But (laughs) I've always wondered when someone says, well, it's an honor to be nominated, whether that's slightly sarcastic Uh. or genuine. Well, if you've been watching the Olympics, which just wrapped up, Mm. I think about that all the time because there was one race where two runners broke the previous world record, but the person that got silver, like that would have been in any other race, that would have been, they would have been the fastest person in the world for that race. And at the same time, someone went faster than by like point oh oh five seven. So now all of a sudden, it's like, are you the best? Like, it, it, are you celebrating or are you? Robert, I almost got there. Oh, I mean, it's true though. Like they oh. sometimes a silver medalist gets that's up there what, and cries and thinks they're a failure, and it's like, right? That's why I say uh, I don't agree with that. I agree with uh, you know that's that's what people think is oh man. If you didn't win, you lost. I, I think don't agree with that I personally at all. see people who are able to qualify for the Olympics. I think that's an honor for me personally. I love Seeing that. that. I'm like, you, you. Oh my God, how hard you must have won. See, I think we can go that. into a longer discussion of how we live in a totally. binary culture, whether if you don't win, you lose. And that's what I don't think is. Now, if you're, the case. If you're standing among that group, whatever right. it may be that's Winner. something to celebrate especially in in terms of the olympics where like you spend your whole life for that 25 second run and if you don't win gold all of a sudden it's some big failure in some people's eyes i just yeah. think that's yeah. that's crazy to think it doesn't happen well, speaking of the olympics note, before we go though uh our good friend blake neely had a cool surprise uh, the rhythmic gymnastics competition 
uh, there was a, a performer, uh, Anastasia Stalos uh, from Belarus, who performed to his awesome main title theme from The Flight Attendant, uh, which I'm going to play a little bit of here. It's always funny that I don't think these composers have any idea. I mean, obviously, this gymnast has been practicing to this probably for several, you know, I guess they, they picked their songs probably a few months before, but the, the composers aren't told about this. So he's mm. watching the Olympics like everyone else, and he posted on on Twitter, "Oh my! Listen to my my theme is playing on the Olympics. How cool is this?" All of a sudden, he's rooting for a Belarusian uh, rhythmic gymnast, um, and it goes back to when I found out about uh, Tara, or not Tara, um, the the figure skater. We talked about it on the very first episode of the the uh, the movie that was made with Margot Robbie, the figure skater. Blanking on her name, Tanya. 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 I Tanya. She, she was skating to Danny Elfman's Batman, and it was kind of one of those like, oh wow moments. You wouldn't think, um, but yeah, they get to pick their songs. And shout out to Blake Neely. That's such a cool theme. In fact, mm-hmm. on uh, more score, that was my prediction for main title theme Emmy winner. Um, I don't know if you guys heard our Emmy picks yet, uh, but you can go over to more score and check that out. And also, we have a new episode up with uh, Austin Wintery, which is really inspiring. Such a cool story. He was uh, in an orchestra class in high school, and the teacher basically let him conduct the entire class at a very young age. It gave him the chops. It gave him the confidence to to get into it. And the the path he took with those skills that he started getting from high school is amazing. Um, jumping into the video game world. And now he's uh, such a valuable asset to composers around the world with his YouTube videos. And um, of course, just a major talent in uh, scoring film and games. Uh, so check that episode out as well. Uh, shout out to Austin for jumping on uh, with us on more score. Um, I think that's it. Are we going to take a break? Let's rock. All right. Coming up after the break, We have Rupert Gregson Williams joining us from the UK. Stick around. This is Score the Podcast presented by Spitfire Audio. We'll be right back. Hey guys, it's Kenny. Back to the show in just a second. If you like Score the Podcast, you're going to want to check out More Score. More Score already has hours of content waiting for you. You can listen to interviews with composers Zach Robinson and Leo Bierenberg of Cobra Kai and Carlos Rafael Rivera, the maestro behind the Queen's Gambit. Plus, we've done a sit down with the founders of Spitfire Audio, Christian Henson and Paul Thompson, who share why not even an erupting volcano could stop them from launching the business. It's a pretty crazy story. More Score is our new Patreon show for Score Superfans. And if you don't know what Patreon is, well, it's a website and an app that lets fans crowdfund the type of extra content you want. And with Patreon, you can listen or watch right on the app. It's really easy. And the best part about More Score, it's year round, just like you asked for, no more off season. Just go to patreon.com slash more score or download the Patreon app and search more score. We'll see you over there. Hi, this is Rachel Portman. You're listening to Score, the podcast. And now let's get back to the show. Welcome back to Score, the podcast presented by Spitfire Audio. For the audience that doesn't know, I'm doing this again because Robert closed his window. Um, So Rupert, you're getting this intro twice. Joining us now, Emmy-nominated composer. You know his music from Wonder Woman, Aquaman, Hacksaw Ridge, Veep, Catch-22, Behind Her Eyes, Hotel Rwanda, and many, many more. Please welcome Rupert Gregson-Williams joining us on the show. Hey, Rupert, how you doing, man? I'm doing very well. Thanks for having me. Rupert, where are you? I'm south of London in the UK. I think you were always... If I'm not mistaken, in some of our possibly unfinished work together, you were south of London as well. Am I correct? That's right. Yeah, yeah. But um, yes, I used to pop up in your office a few times a year, uh, fresh with my studio English tan. I remember. Is that yeah. is that like the principal's office yeah. when you go to Robert's <laughs> office? I never got called there. I had to bash on the door. <laughs> That's, you know, I had a... Uh, a reputation for always having my door closed. I know that's unfashionable in this era of 
incredible openness and flowing workspaces and all that, but I really treasured my privacy. So I, and I would always love to see a composer of your stature coming to visit me. So <laughs> I hope so. Rupert, of all those incredible credits that were mentioned, uh, I have two favorites. And as I was looking through your credits and listening to your opus this past week, I frankly had forgotten that you scored Behind Her Eyes, which I absolutely loved. I don't know if you get enough credit for that or acknowledgement because there's so many big blockbusters there, but that was an incredible series. It's actually fun doing the uh, the darker stuff and doing the, the, I mean, the blockbusters are just so all life encapsulating, you know, so with the TV stuff, I find I have a little bit more time to write thematics and just spend some time uh, as I'm doing now on something where you could just spend two or three months just assembling your ammunition and then off you go to the races on TV. And uh, and I had that with Behind the eye, behind Your Eyes, yeah. I, I'm surprised because traditionally, or maybe in a, the former era, people would say, I have no time on TV. You know, I have a little time on movies, but TV is so slam-bam, every week there's an episode. And you're saying the opposite. Do you find that's the case now, that TV gives you the luxury of being able to spend some time where movies are a certain different level of pressure? You know, I, I, I have done TV where I've had the call, I've had the meeting, I've got hired, and by the way, the first dub of the first episode is in a month's time. Let's get going. But um, on, the, on, the, on, the, on the, the pieces that I am sort of have chased down because they interested me or whatever, like The Crown or behind, uh, I mean, it's the same producers uh, behind her eyes. Um, uh, or Catherine the Great. These are these are all ones that I I know the directors or I or the producers, and I got in with the scripts, and I got in early. And I find oh, the Alienist was another actually, which I just had a load of fun with because I had the scripts. They were shooting. I went down to the set. Um, like you say, you don't always get that opportunity, but and, and and in the past I haven't. But I kind of try and make sure I do that. It doesn't really interest me that much to do. I, I say it interests me. That's that's the wrong way of putting it. I I, I try and avoid doing jobs, uh, the TV jobs, where I'm just getting hard and bang, it's out. It just the, the fun, the Alienist and um, and Catherine the Great was some of the most fun I've had because I just got time to play instruments. You know, I bought a couple of instruments, taught myself to play things badly, huh. scraped some things, um, recorded them, and just and had some fun. You know. Let's go back a little bit because uh, the second episode we ever did of this podcast was with your brother. For those of you, if you don't know, it's not a coincidence. Uh, Rupert and Harry are brothers, and um, we like to go talk about your backstory a little bit and what's going on in the in the household to get two brothers at the highest level. I mean, it's like the NBA. You, there's only a couple <laughs> duos of like family members that play in a, in a league at that level at the at the highest level, and you know, you have the Danas, the, the Newmans, uh, and, and you guys, I think, are the only ones off the top of my head that are at this level. How in the world does this happen where you both get to this level? Where, what was going on in your house musically um, when you were a kid? My, my old man, my dad used to um, wheel us out uh, and make us play or sing. Or, you know, can you guys, you're going to do the Jungle Book, but can you do it in a three-part harmony? I have another brother called Ben who's a great musician, but didn't come into the into um into this trade um but so we used to so we used to make up harmonies on the on the hoof in our dressing gowns standing on the piano pleasing my dad and then you know once he'd had his fun he'd just send us back upstairs so <laughs> we um we learned a little bit from that and then we were luckily both of us sent to um uh, to st john's cambridge as choristers we both had that um harry's five years older than me and he started uh, he started five years ahead of me and was and left having been head chorister of, of a you know some, an amazing opportunity to be in in a in a choir school like like that. Uh, he left having been head chorister. The, the term I I turned up in my little shorts and uh, a squeaky and um, and so I wasn't there at the same time as him, which was good because we've done a lot of this stuff in our lives as as you know you know I now we're working together on something which is um, which is great. 
I mean, we've been sort of so far apart. Um, so, uh, yeah, so our, our family were just uh, absorbed by music. We had two pianos. One of the really lovely things, I was talking about it with Harry just a couple of weeks ago, or even the last time I spoke to last week. Um, we had two pianos and we played duets, two piano duets a lot. My old man had these books that just, you know, Haydn uh, quartets or, or, or uh, uh, um, arrangements of, of Haydn and Schumann mostly. And we'd play two piano duets, which is, is a great thing. I hadn't done it since I was a kid. Uh, and it's just, the, it was the best time. The last time we did that, Harry and I, it was 20 years ago, we were talking about writing together. It's kind of like doing the duets we did as kids, you know. Rupert, I'm a younger brother as well, and it took me many years not to be, I wasn't Robert Kraft for a long time. I was Steve and Ken Kraft's younger brother. That's how I was identified. And um, were you, when you showed up at yep, school, uh, same exact yeah. thing here. were you Harry's younger brother? Uh, I was, uh, but actually, I didn't for, for a long time. It, it, do, do you have an identity? I, I didn't bother. It didn't bother me because he was popular. He was a good sportsman. He was a musician, you know. So it didn't bother me. I, I, I lapped that up. Uh, turning up in the studios in, in offices like yours, actually, you know, twenty years ago, and being you were always very kind and didn't know me as Harry, uh, as Harry's brother. Or when I remember when I <laughs> when I used to this, I can tell this story because we all know it's not true. But I would. Uh, I, you know, Hans would very sweetly introduce me to this is this is Rupert, the talented one. He always used to say, which was his <laughs> his very very sweet effort of sort of making me not feel ridiculously, um, you know, inadequate because my brother was, you know, obviously is is is, is a great composer. Um, so that was very generous, and I'm sure you were too when I turned up at your office, Robert. Oh, that's so kind. Um, I mean, you also. You and Harry have different styles. I don't. I don't think we should talk about Harry any more than we need to. But you're also singular composers in your own way. So yeah, I totally. would. I would hope that that producers understand that. And it's not my job at this point to help them understand it. But uh, I think it's. I think it's very interesting that the two of you do it, and that the two of you are working together. Tell us. Remind me what you're working on right now with Harry. Um, with Harry, uh, The Gilded Age, which is the Julian Fellows um, HBO show set in the Gilded Age, the 1880s to, to, to the turn of the century. Um, and uh, we've literally only been on it for, for a little while. And once again, we've got a bit of time to play with ideas. And this one, we did catch 22 together. Um, which was great fun with Clooney, and uh, we love that. That was good fun. This one, um, we've we've worked. It's it's much smoother process. We've been through the sort of pain of Catch Twenty Two. Was is because we both really, even though I'm the younger brother, I'm still you know people still introduce me now as veteran composer Rupert Gregson Williams, which is a little sad. But um, <laughs> but uh, so we've both been at it for quite a while now, and um, so. So we both have our own teams. We have our own way of doing things, the way of writing, obviously, and the technicalities and the logistics. Um, so we're just beginning to get used to each other and give each other space and, and be generous to each other's sort of foibles because both of us have plenty of them. You know. How are you different? What are you discovering when you work with Harry? Because um, you said you worked with Catch-22. That was the first time you guys have ever collaborated on a big project together. Maybe you did in, in your childhood or something, but in terms of like film and TV, this is the first time you've had a co-credit like that. Um, what are you learning about each other in this room, even though you're brothers and you grew up together? Well, it's interesting. He, we also, uh, I just want to interrupt have... to say, Go on, Robert. we also can provide therapeutic services if there's anything you want to share that has never been shared you want to lie down uh and and talk about oh, you know we, we we've we've been through that we we're actually it's good if i if you'd mentioned that to me 10 years ago maybe i might have taken you up on it but um no we're all good now thank you but um no with uh i well one thing i am learning is is that we are t we have such a different um different form of writing melody and even different, a different for, uh, way of telling a story. You know, I mean, I know, I, I, I know, you know, Harry will often sort of 
look at the way I'll write 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 a scene, and I and I'm sure he would have did it done it differently, and he might have done it at a different pace. And we all have these conversations where you know we bo- <laughs> we both uh, have similar harmonic structures to the way we write, but our attitude to storytelling is is um, is is very different. Um, I mean, I know our writing is very different, but we understand each other harmonically. But um, but that's something we've had to get used to, and and also probably be patient with. I mean, he's been very, but on this one, he's been very um, much more uh, willing to, to 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 let me take my way, as I have with his. It's because before it was it's it's very um, when you write with somebody, forget them being a bro- being a brother. It's if you have a if you if you're convinced that something is right and they're pulling another way, but you can see there is strength in it. But there it's but it's obviously but if it's pulling away from where your where you your senses are telling you it's it, i find it, it it's it's exhilarating now but it on catch 22 it was it was tricky and we we came through it which was great but uh it, it had its moments where he wanted to go that way i wanted to go the other and we both thought if we went the other person's way we might fall over and uh <laughs> and we didn't do you write in the same room um or are you writing remotely we're writing remotely, but like like I say about the duets um, comment that we made the other day to each other, we've, we've been doing a lot of um, Zoom and a lot of um, uh, we've just been spending a lot of time in each other's company. So we we are we kind of virtually are in the same room. We are virtually in the same room, but we're a lot of at first it felt peculiar, but now we're actually quite good. One person will be at the piano. When we did Catch Twenty Two, we were in the same um, uh, same city in the same room a lot. But this one we haven't been able to. But um, no, it's it's become it feels natural now. We've been on it for a few weeks, um, which which is great. And uh, like I say, Harry's been very uh, very patient and generous with me on this one. And 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 I feel I have to him. And it's been it's felt very natural. Whereas uh, before it was most peculiar having someone else treading all over my logistical plan for for the world. How helpful is it for you to have a brother that does the same type of career, uh, you know, as you? Because we often hear so much about, you know, the the director is like a a, a therapist and trying to understand the composer and and or I'm sorry, the the composer is the therapist trying to understand the director's vision. But you you have the ability that you have a family member that does the same type of work as you that you can bounce ideas off of, you can talk to in private and maybe vent to that maybe you wouldn't with a, a team member on a project you're working on because you don't want that sort of drama to get out there. But is that, do you, do you guys rely on each other for kind of therapy sessions? Um, I don't think we mean to, but we definitely do. Yeah. I mean, and I know, um, I know Harry's character inside out. I couldn't, there can't be many people who know him more than I do. And, and same with, with, with me. And I know he's, uh, we all have our insecurities and there are certain parts of a, uh, of a, a project where you feel most insecure musically. And it's nice to be able to call up on, on Harry. I, I do it. And, and he, de- he definitely uses me too. I have a couple of friends too in, in the business that, that, that I, I rely on. I mean, we, we must all, we all have to have that network. Be very lonely otherwise. Um, and you know that the, it can be very difficult to understand how the, the, the pressures that you, you come under, um, and uh, certainly Harry understands those. And we've all worked with. Uh, I mean, that, that that's the point, isn't it? We work with people who are going to test us a bit, and the more people that we work with that are going to test us, the more difficult they become because they they try and rip it out of you, try and bring you up to their level of understanding of the story, and, and it becomes painful, but glorious, you know. And so it becomes more painful. I'm excited that Talk guilt, the, the combination of guilt. My brother's just calling me. I'll turn my phone off. Tell Harry that uh, we are still hoping that the Man on Fire Q 4M3, he could fix the bass line <laughs> under the scene with Denzel. Just tell him I, I need to speak to him about that. Uh, it's it, There's something okay. uh, no, I, it's slightly out, right. out, of, out of time with the drums. <laughs> um, actually, that's an an experience that uh, was wonderful. But I, I wonder, Rupert, do you stay in touch with the remote control crowd? I know that Hans is part of your life at one point. Yeah. And as he is part of all of our lives. I do. I do. I've, I've got great friends there. And Hans is, is, is still a, a very, you know, close friend. And, um, 
he was my mentor and 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 over the years we've just become you know very solid and, and great friends and i i rely on him in the same way i do with harry and i feel he can do with me too um and also i mean all, all the whole family i mean as you know you don't need me to tell you the, the, the remote control family but uh I, there are there are various composers that have come up through there that i uh, i'm very close to still um um but i yeah did I, you have a room there no um no i don't i do, do use you know if i have to come into town and do which i do i uh, haven't had to for the last year or so but i'll uh you know obviously i'll take a room there if i if i if i need to um for presentations and what have you yeah and there there was you know and on wonder woman you actually stepped into in some ways a lane that remote control had already <laughs> set down yes was that a huge was wonder woman a doing a huge superhero marvel film did you feel that was a departure for you was it part of a continuum that had already been started or was it wow this is both corporately and uh thematically new territory yeah, it was really really new territory and uh, and i uh, i did feel the pressure on it but I, i'd done um a legend of tarzan the year before which is obviously not a uh a superhero movie and, and it wasn't as big a blockbuster or it wasn't as big a deal for for warner brothers but i it was kind of good practice because it was fairly enormous project to to to, 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 to get into because prior to that, you know, I was, you know, before before Legend of Tarzan, I was, you know, I was uh, uh, Adam Sandler's guy, you know, and um, so people would not see that I would be, uh, I was going to be, they weren't going to hire me for their superhero movies. Um, but I embraced it massively, and I, uh, I, I loved it. You know, there's, it's, it's a little bit like um, animations in the sense that there's just no size that is too much. You know, uh, there's no, there's nothing you can imagine that isn't too ridiculous in a superhero movie or an animation, really, um, um, because they are both beyond the imagination. Hopefully, if they're good, they're beyond beyond the imagination. So you have to match that. Too. Can you can you talk about that? That's um, the first time. I, I'm sorry. I just love to hear you talk. That's the first time I've ever heard a composer say that, and I that's really interesting when you say there's no size that is unimaginable on animation or superhero movies. Tell me. Uh, a little more about that because uh, that's teaching me something. Well, animations for a start. I mean, obviously they 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 they've been drawn from someone's imagination, uh, and you know they're animals that are talking and running and what have you. So nothing is believable. So um, there's nothing that I love more than than writing something really cheeky or small or massively stupid. I mean, I I went on o over the hedge having. A very large soprano singing over, you know, thirty double basses, um, uh, and a, a couple of moog synths. You know, but just doing that was ridiculous because the scene was ridiculous. Steve Carell was standing in front of a, a, a hedge, calling it Steve, um, and that, and that just inspires, you know, inspires stupidity. So I guess the same can be said for for you know doing Wonder Woman or Aquaman. I mean, I threw myself at Aquaman. And used uh, a ridiculous amount of synths because I thought, you know, that if you're going to use synths, why not? Um, why not really use them or just really, really play to them? Don't just stick one in, you know. Get get a room full of them and and have some fun. So yeah, size, size. It, it gives you a chance to be the the other. I guess the the shoes on the other foot when you're doing a small drama or if you're doing a comedy. I mean, if you overscore something. You are in trouble, and you know, with Adam, for instance, if I score the the comedy too much, or even score the comedy full stop, he'll uh, he'll say, "What are you What are you doing? We we know I hate that, and uh, why are we doing it?" Um, whereas with with uh, with a Wonder Woman who's jumping through the air, just about to smash a god in the face, um, you know, gives you license to be ridiculously large too, and that's fun. You, know. you can't be delicate. You mentioned uh, Hans Zimmer, and, and and we were talking about remote control, but I'd love to know about that process. When you're working alongside Hans, like how long in your time working there were you handed something that was like the real deal, like you need to step up now? And and what what is that moment like for you where you're, you're kind of working there and then all of a sudden you're tasked with something? 
um, for the first time. Do you remember what that was? Uh, well, I, I, uh, that was, it was a long time ago. It was over 20 years ago. Um, when I, and I started working for hands on Prince of Egypt and, you know, I don't think anything I wrote made the film, but I, he, he was, he was very, uh, very generous in that respect, gave me a cue, very important cue. I don't know. Someone was milking a camel, I should think. And, uh, gave me three weeks, you know, I mean, I, I or gave me some time to do it and it took me three or four weeks to get from the beginning to the end. And then he had plenty of notes because, because I hadn't reached, I hadn't fully understood the level of that one has to bring oneself up to, to, to be at that level. I was, as you know, young and learning the trade, but that is generosity. And that is hands again, because he knew that I wasn't going to nail anything, but it was, you know, down the line in a couple of years time, maybe, maybe this guy is going to, you know, I, if I invest a little bit of time in him, he, he will. And, and, and luckily that happened. And I, and I hope that, um, that we all as composers, and I hope I, I've had a, a one or two composers who have gone on to, to do, uh, to have a career, and I hope I was patient enough to to realize that you know uh, the same thing. And I learned that from Hans. Is my point I'm trying to make. It's one of his greatest assets. Is is his gift of of mentorship? I mean, it's just. Of course, we know that he's brilliant as a composer, but I'm not sure that his influence is acknowledged as fully with a generation. No, and I don't think it's recognized as positively as you're saying, you know, um, but um, that it's always massively generous and patient. And God, God, I used to phone him from here and he'd say, well, come out, come out, come out. And I'd say, no, I've got to, I've got to plow my own furrow hands. I got, you know, I was staying here doing a little bit of TV or something. And I, he used to give me the time. So I, I, I realize now I, I, uh, I, um, I have, have young people who phone me and try and you know want to get into the business and what have you and giving people the time to listen to their remembering how how embarrassing it is to think of how ridiculous the requests i was making of of, of people like hands but especially Hans, that I, I try to give the time now to those people i think it comes um, back it's a difficult business to get into right oh you think yeah. i i thought you just kind of take a bus to los angeles or london uh <laughs> And say, hey, I'm here. You <laughs> Sometimes we've heard those stories. Yeah. I, have you been to, here's a silly question. It's a leading one. Rupert, have you ever been to Kigali, Rwanda? I haven't. No, never been to Kigali. Uh, no, I've heard a lot about it. And as you know, I know a bit about it. Yeah. I just, um, I wonder because bizarrely in my travels, I had lunch at the Hotel Rwanda. You did? Um, a couple of years ago. And. Looked around and thought of the film and realized you'd scored it and thought, well, you must have, you know, stayed in a hotel room here for months and months and months <laughs> writing, soaking up the vibe. Though I know that that's, it'd be like saying, boy, if you're going to score a science fiction movie, you better go into space. Yeah. Um, that was a big movie for you, though. It that, was. That movie it was a big movie. Called and a I, lot of attention. I did. And I didn't have it. I mean, the reality of it is, and I have done two or three of these over the years. Uh it was a, it was where I was brought on to help because it, the score wasn't going in quite in the direction, uh, and you know they wanted to get the film out to to film festivals, and there wasn't enough time for for the original composer to to finish the score. Really, uh, that's that's the bottom line. So they brought me on, and I um so I didn't have a long. It was one of those ones where I was I was literally two weeks. You've got to score it. Wow. And um, two weeks. And that's mm -hmm. so so. You know, looking back on it, it would those that is what I would have done. I probably wouldn't have gone to Rwanda. Maybe I'm not sure whether I'd gone to Rwanda, but I certainly would have done a lot more uh, research than I did. I didn't have a lot of chance. All I did was uh, I, they gave me a reams of paper. Re, you know, uh, there was no YouTube in those days, so well there probably was, but I, I didn't know about it. So I, I you know, had a couple of videos to watch, and um, and off I went to the races. So yeah, that one I could name a couple of others that were very short short processes um, that I didn't get enough time to invest. And on the crown, were you brought in early in the process? Were you uh, interviewed about your feelings uh, on the monarchy? And, and uh, <laughs> did, did you have to pay homage to the queen? How, how did that job evolve? And um, during the series, did your work evolve? 
well, how that, that, how that evolved and how it actually arrived was um, through a lunch with Hans Zimmer and Peter Morgan. There you go. There's, there's Hans again um, um, helping my career. He, well, he's great friends with Peter. Um, I've admired Peter's work, but I'd never met him before. And we had lunch. Peter was just writing this new thing that was going to enhance said, look, I've read a script. It's going to be the best thing on TV. Uh, and I, I've got to be honest with you. It was a little bit like the first time I heard about the internet, you know, I thought, why, why will it be? It's about Elizabeth. Um, it's about a, a slightly, you know, little old lady. Um, and, um, and Peter then over lunch at Claridge's of all places told me, um, all about it and uh so uh so then i uh, he got me in to meet with some directors and and um i was luckily enough got the job then but that was way in advance I and mean, he was still they would they the, they'd started shooting but they were shooting for six to eight months after i was hired so i had peter here in my studio here in sussex in, in southern england um lots and that was really that that was the best thing for me and Another of those occasions where the director or the, or the rather the showrunner and, and producer pushed, he pushed me to places that I, you know, it was painful at the time, but he did push me in. And I've definitely, they weren't my first instincts where I, where, where I ended up on the score. And, um, uh, but Peter, you know, there were, lo- there were places where I would have gone and been happy with, and Peter wasn't, and he pushed me and pushed me and I hated him for it. Um, but, uh, but I was, you know, we became great friends afterwards because i i was so thankful he'd, he'd pushed me to do something half decent where as before it would have been something stately hmm. and that's interesting not half decent and uh, also i actually identifies that i guess as you know and i found out certain directors writers and producers un- truly understand music and understand the value of it understand the impact of it understand how to speak about it intelligently, uh, even sometimes in, in silence. I mean, yeah. I used to watch Ridley Scott with various composers, some of whom you know. Sometimes his silence spoke volumes, and you had to read it. Either that doesn't work kind of silence, or let's yeah. move on, that's fine. And But but he was always spot on, and his, his pithy yeah. remarks, and so... Peter, when you say he was influential with you, it, I'm assuming that he understood music and its and its impact and could be articulate about it, or just had a way of saying um, emotionally that's wrong. Well, no, he he got a very he very big understanding of how how, how much it could influence his writing, and he's very protective over his mm. writing. Um, and I guess what what I I don't know. This is probably revealing my um, my lack of education or or something or my lack of imagination but it took a lot of pressure from him to to for me to see his writing is so clever underneath there are little there are layers going on and there are little edgy edgy things that are happening on what could be quite a banal in on the face of it it could be quite banal but there's something going on and he would um he would have to sort of talk me through it and really really push me and then, and, and, and that would give me, he would, what, what was his expression? His expression for, for, I want, I want a, I want like a stone in my shoe. I want a bit of grit in my heel, <laughs> please. And I never really understood what he meant until I started writing things with a bit of an edge. And it was a little bit more modern where I, than where I started off. And he made me understand a very, very good script writing. I hadn't read script, the scripts quite as deep, deeply written as, uh, as Peter does. I think just before we break and take a minute to catch our breath, is there a particular scene? Uh, I'm a huge fan of The Crown, and, and I'm thinking, is there a particular scene or character that you can share where you wrote something and Peter suggested put a stone in the shoe of the queue? Is there anything that comes to mind as your first draft um, ended up very different? Uh, yeah, I get, well, where he where I kept on getting the my my instincts weren't right and he wanted us to feel something different was when when the uh when elizabeth hears about the death of her father when she's in she's in kenya and um i had written something emotional uh, you know mm-hmm. she'd lost her father 
And sure. uh, he wanted it to be a much bigger story. He wanted it to be, and of course, it's very obvious now in, in retrospect, but he wanted it to all be about the, 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 this is the moment where the tectonic plates of the world at that time, or the empire was so large at that time, that the tectonic plates are going to shift and everything changes from this moment forth. The British Empire is gone and, and or, you know, all, all of this is gone and it changes. So he wanted tectonic. I wrote a piece called Tectonic Plates after that mm. um, because um, it, I had I'd seen this young lady losing her father, but he was talking about, yeah, but this it changes the world. And um, so that was it. That was uh, that was an important scene. Wonderful. So go back and re-listen to that one. Um, we're going to take a quick break uh, more with Rupert Gregson Williams. Stick around. We'll be right back. Have you guys um, made a more score turbo Bentley yet with like score the podcast on one it's, side? It's part of our merch that we're developing. Cause that I would be It's a really high to. tier. Yeah. But it's, it's going to be there. Giant, yeah. If you uh, contribute $350,000 to month. more score on Patreon. We will put our score logo on the steering wheel of your new Bentley so that you could look at it. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I feel like we're rolling right into a read for more score. Another read for more score. Uh, what is more score? It's our Patreon show. Um, you can basically go see all of these other interviews that we're starting to uh, collect and do these chats with different composers and people from other fields. I'm really excited. I think we have some interesting stuff in the works um, that will be out by the time anyone is hearing this. Uh, so that's exciting. And uh, we have these really interesting guests uh, talking about the way that they make the music that we all love. It's stuff that doesn't fit into score the podcast. Um, and if it, it would be weird if it, if we crammed in a two and a half hour episode, I'm sure some people would love it, but it takes a lot of our time. And that's where Patreon comes in. It allows us to go out and spend the extra time to produce these things um, and do so with the support of our patrons who one can help support that financially. You know, even the software and the equipment takes, uh, there's some money that has to, has to pay for things, but it also gives the, ability for a lot of our patrons to interact with us, tell us the things that they want to hear about, people that they're interested in talking to, and um, and and just be able to engage with us in our group on our, our Patreon page, patreon.com slash more score. Uh, Kenny, what's your uh, favorite stuff that we've done on Patreon so Oh, far? you guys are going to dig the Cobra Kai conversation. And if you're like me and you've seen every episode... First off, I think it was the most passion I've ever heard a composer talk about a show they've worked on. These guys love the everything about the show, and they're perfect composers for the show. Um, so that that conversation was really fun. Uh, Fernando uh, Arroyo Lascarain, his his discussion about uh, playing in the orchestra on the stage on the sound stages, I found that so interesting because we've had so many conversations about composers uh, and you know with composers. But to hear the perspective of a violin player who's sitting in that room, who's one of those elite members of that uh, orchestra, super, super interesting, just all of the different things. Like there was one discussion we had where he talked about what happens if something is impossible to play. And I've always wondered that. What if the composer writes something that's too fast and they're, they're not a violinist and they don't know that that's not possible? And like, that that strings group has to figure something out to make it work and fast because the you know time is money in those situations. So I don't know. There's there's hours and hours of content already available, and we have a lot more coming up. I know Robert has a couple of things on the books uh, with some other avenues of filmmaking regarding sound that I really can't wait to hear uh, your conversations, Robert. So I, I don't want to tease too much in that, but. Um, there's a lot of stuff. Yeah, on well, the way. it's going to be. It's part of the 360 degree view of the entire world of film music. We're not only going to the score working, cinematic universe, right? With the uh, the people that write the music, but there's a whole support structure that's really interesting to share and to introduce our fabulous audience to how those scores make it all the way from the pencil to the screen. I think I just wrote 
the title of my autobiography, <laughs> Robert Kraft, From the Pencil to the Screen. It's important to note about... You better get to that. work, Robert. You got to get writing. I was, I was just going to say, it, it's important to know about more score, too, that this is going to be something that's year-round, so when our season of Score the Podcast ends, we see everybody's comments. When are you guys coming back? When is the next season? Well, that's never going to happen again if you're a part of more score. We're going to have episodes for you all throughout the year, and um, we, we're also taking suggestions. You can message the inbox, and if you have someone you think we should talk to or a type of uh, you know, different craft of filmmaking that you want to get a little insight on, um, we can do it. So it's, it's very that interactive. Might be another good title. It's, it's a lot of fun. The craft of filmmaking. <laughs> yeah. And um, you know, this is a way for us to, to make a year-round season. There's no commercials. It's not a sponsored show. So the way we're able to do it and, and the time we spend on it is uh, from your support as a patron of the show. So that's kind of the backstory of it. And uh, we hope you join and uh, give us your ideas as well because it's a lot of fun. And uh, again, year-round, can't beat it. There you have it. More score. It's patreon.com slash more score or download the Patreon app. Super easy on your phone. You just create an account there and search for more score and we will see you guys there. Hey, this is Bear McCreary. You're listening to score the podcast. Now back to the show. Welcome back to score the podcast presented by Spitfire Audio. We're here with Rupert Gregson Williams. Rupert, here's the, a simple question. What was your most challenging score and why? Um, I, in terms of uh, wrestling the material into a cohesive score, um, I think actually we've just been talking about The Crown. The Crown was very painful for me. <laughs> and uh, um, as I alluded to before, it was, it was understanding the sort of depth of the writing. Um, but there are other scores where, um, I mean, I really loved the result, the end result with the crown, uh, and loved the ending of it. But I, but, but the actual the creation of it was uh, was quite painful. Um, so yes, I think the crown and two Emmy nominations for your okay. efforts. Yeah, exactly. Why not? Uh, thank you, Peter. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. What What about besides the crown? Is there something, maybe a film or something you can identify where? You, you really had some trouble. Obviously, you, you came through it. The film got done. But it's always fascinating to hear what, what you went through to get to the masterpiece. Or the finish line. <laughs> well, um, there's a, I, <laughs> you're the finish line rather than the masterpiece. Um, well, the, obviously, the earlier films, when you're really learning your, 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 your trade, uh, are, are, can, are, are, can be very, very tricky because... Uh, I, I was very lucky, actually. I had a, uh, an agent called Maggie Rodford in London who, when I got my first couple of... Uh, they, they weren't studio picks by this point. They were, they were still small indie films. But for me, it was, a, it, was, it was a lot of responsibility and money riding on it from the, from, from the producers. So I really, really learned a lot from her about the whole process. Um, um, but I guess, uh, I guess the one that, that I felt the most responsibility perhaps was um my first animation with which was over the hedge and that mm. was once again you know it was dreamworks where you know back in those days you know hans of course was 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 very much a, a, an influence over there in the music department and i felt um felt some responsibility that i'd been given some you know been given some uh responsibility there to to make it to write a good score so that that was that was very tricky for me and that uh, on animations i there are two directors often and that was very strange to me too working with two directors rather than one you know having more than two bosses plus it's my first studio film so there were you know jeffrey katzenberg as well so we had a suddenly there was a studio boss and he he wanted to know and uh, he had an opinion <laughs> uh, as, as you know and um so that was that was tough i i, I actually the the process became uh, uh, quite easy for me because I think because it was such a fun cheeky film and, and and once I'd found it, we we were going and off to the races. But I, I at the beginning it was that was a stress. I bet. Was it because it was animation, or what? What made it challenging? Uh, obviously, it was your first studio picture and all of that. But in terms of the the film itself, did did animation play a role in that being difficult? 
No, no, it's funny you should ask, actually. It's not really. It wasn't actually the music that was hard. It was the uh, the first time of, of, of the politics. So, you know, mm. we had Jeffrey Katzenberg, head of a studio. Then you have two directors who are also working for Jeffrey and trying to uh, work out how he wants to make this movie. And then I'm working for the directors, but I'm also working for the studio. Um, that that those that that politics I I found quite hard. I was green, and um, but you know I, I got through it. I mean you know I probably through just through um, through writing a lot, a lot of a lot of music and uh, trying to charm everybody that it was all going to be all right in the end. Charm is a good word, and it is uh, a reminder of Hans used to say. Hans and I had this conversation many times about what makes a great composer and what components, and he was the one who taught me. I thought it was two things. I thought it was diplomacy and musical skills. He taught me it was three things, and he brings all of them. He he said, yes, it's musical skills, which a lot of people have. Uh, it's political skills, which a lot of people can learn, some don't. And Hans is the master. I mean, I saw Hans in any number of situations where directors would say something that was stultifyingly inane about a piece of music. And Hans, instead of saying, that's ridiculous, would say, hmm, let me think about that. Can you talk a little more about what you would want? And I just look at him with, you know, reverence that he didn't say, that makes no sense. You know, yeah. can you make the planet have a little more hair in the music and and you just want to say i'd like to leave now and hans would say explain what you mean emotionally but he also <laughs> taught me the third but it's actually go ahead go on robert you go to the third one no he would say the third the third thing he would say is that a great composer needs something you've mentioned already already which is storytelling ability in music and that was a revelation for me to hear that 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 it's so obvious, but I never thought of that as that's an attribute that a composer needs. He needs to, he can't just say, I'm going to write a song and it's going to be about love and that's it. He needs to tell the story that's in the script. He needs to tell the story that the director is implying, as you mentioned with The Crown. He needs to tell the bigger story. I never really thought of that um, as it's something that some composers, it's something that all film composers have. Uh, and great ones have, and you yeah. know, they're great writers. It's interesting that um, uh, the I was I was thrown a book once, and I forget I, I'm shamefully can't remember the author's name, but uh, it was about script writing, uh, and I thought it was quite an insulting thing to be thrown. Um, uh, just you know, did it did it mean, did it mean I had no understanding of of uh, story? But I read it, and that really helped me. This was a long time, this was twenty twenty five years ago. Um, but it really helped me understand more of what we were doing. Uh, it wasn't all about, you know, I think I was probably wanting at that point to write complex harmonies or something. I was all up my own um, interest uh, musically rather than the story. So that's probably was just a lesson learned. But I did get, uh, uh, Hans taught me a lesson. Um, I turned up at a session of his uh, to conduct, and it was at Fox actually, and um and i i went up to the director introduced myself said hello and then went into the on and sat on the uh and started talking to the band and, and we we recorded did three days successful recording fine hans and i went out for dinner on the third night and he told me he said look i didn't tell you this when you walked in the door but this this director had come up to him and said look seems like a very nice chap but he seems so depressed um do you think we really want him? This is a comedy. Do we want him to to, to, to conduct? And he sort of defended me and said, "It's all right. He, you know, he's just very serious. He's English. He'll, he'll we'll conduct." But um, the reason what he sort of taught me there was actually that I, I hadn't really I hadn't really thought of the director. I'd been said hello to the director, but I hadn't understood what I was what how I was portraying myself. And I think being the sort of cagey English person twenty years ago, it took me a little while to get into the sort of LA thing where actually. Um, one has to be, you know, show one's emotions or, or, or show one's appreciation of things or to try and explain oneself rather than holding it all in. Uh, obviously, I'm probably still very, uh, you know, uh, retired, uh, retiring Englishman. But believe me, 20 years ago, I was worse. 
but that that was a um, that was a good lesson of, of of being emotional and showing people how you feel rather than holding it in because uh, directors need that they need to be they need to be told they need to be they need to be coerced they need to be have their hand that's held. that's such a deep th- that's a deep thing to tell somebody um to share with i mean he could have just went along and and you know smoothed it over and you guys went to dinner and never and never shared it to you do you think about that now like every time you're working with somebody no, 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 no. That was a lesson I learned at the time. No, no, but I, I was good. That's you can only tell a really good friend that. I mean, I, you know, I would, I, and you can tell people things uh, that probably help me m- be honest with people about the way they're being in a, in, a, in an environment because you just you have to learn. It, it, no one's going to be good enough to tell you um, as a youngster. That's you know. I think it's so wonderful that Hans saved it. Yeah. Till the last dinner <laughs> yeah, too. Right. There's something very elegant about that. It reminds me of a great Hollywood maxim, which um, I learned early on, which is sincerity is crucial. If you can fake that, you've got it made. And I thought <laughs> that's so that, yeah. it's so Hollywood, yeah. uh, you know, but yeah. people do want to know that you're into it and you love it and everything's great. And what yeah. can I say? It's the best thing I've ever heard. I mean, that's the famous um that's the famous remark of any Hollywood executive, which is, I love it. This is amazing. Can you change it? I mean, that's <laughs> that's just perfect yeah. Hollywood. But um, you said something interesting about working with Adam Sandler and how he would have a uh, yeah. a note. And, and if you were too comic, I think I've always thought, and we've mentioned superhero movies, you've mentioned animation. I've always thought that comedy was the hardest kind of music to score because yeah. if you Mickey Mouse it or if you wah, 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 when there's a funny moment, you've ruined it. Um, often composers will say they just play it straight. I'm not sure how you play it straight in an Adam Sandler film, but was Adam good with music? I think you can share. He's a friend of all of ours. Did was he yeah did he give you free he's, reign or did he have lots of notes or somewhere in between he's a pretty musical guy too he's very musical i'm in a band with him we do we well when when the world was a slightly different place we'd play uh, a, a gig every year uh you know the band would would be made up of a few of us as mates uh friends of adam's so maybe five or six and then we'd have guest artists you know we'd have slash would be playing guitar or we'd have you know <laughs> or, or uh, Blondie would turn up and sing with us. You know, it was uh, you know um, uh, just just great, great fun. Um, so he's he's. I mean, he turned up at my first gig with him with his guitar and said, "Where do I plug in?" Ah, <laughs> so love there's an that. orchestra out there. Uh, you can plug he, in the board. He if plays you like. on the score. No, no, no. He was he was kidding. He was kidding oh, me okay. as well. It's typical Adam joke. You know, he turned up with his guitar and said, "Where do I plug in?" But um, but uh. Yeah, no, he's he's got a, a strong opinion about music, and and, and he's, has got a great ear, and knows, and and he, do, he doesn't talk technically about stuff. He doesn't talk oboes and flutes, but he knows what he likes, and he and and he knows when he wants me to change it up. Um, but what he one of his pet hates would be, um, would be me trying to make some of his jokes funny by by underscoring them or, or pointing them out. It just to him, it's just I'm just telling him that he's not very funny. <laughs> this isn't a funny joke if you're trying to tell everybody uh so so i don't so i don't go anywhere near the jokes very rarely anyway unless it's a, a kid's film that we do or something um but yeah he's i mean god i mean back in back in the days i mean we I, one of the first films we did had you know just music in the cafe the source music playing was you know a led zepp track or just you know on the on the car radio when you're driving along there was uh, you know um a who track or something so it's a great i mean you i'm not sure whether there's the budget around for all those sort of things anymore not anymore um or whether the things have changed but uh but that that was a real treat but i i love working with them i do i do a movie with them every year i think i probably have done for since i started working with them so many how did how did you guys first connect um on click um Someone just gave me his phone number and said, "Give give this guy a call. Uh, he's looking for a composer. the The composer hasn't worked out on this movie, and um, 
give them a call and I phoned them and they were just, they were, uh, there were four or five composers already doing a pitch for something. And, um, I, I, they sent me a bit of a film over. It was actually the last scene in click, very emotional. And I, um, I did that thing of, 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 of saying, I just know where I can do this now. I had to do it by the next day because everybody else had been on it for a few days. And, um, so I got up at five in the morning instead and, and nailed this, this thing luckily and, uh, sent it in and, uh, and, uh, that was just history. So yeah, it was, uh, it was a lucky someone just phoned me. A- Did you rescore the entire film yeah. as a result? Yeah. Yeah. Nice. Amazing. I would amaz- imagine that with Adam Sandler films, as much as it's the content of the music, it's spotting the jokes. Yeah. And when you describe that he doesn't want you to step on a joke or you make it funny. I think that's the hardest thing about composing a comic film I always saw with composers was sometimes no music is the funniest thing of all. Yeah. Or starting it much later than you think your instinct says, oh, we'll start the music here. But mm. And I, I imagine that spotting a Adam Sandler film is half the work and how yeah. to spot it. It is, you know. Funnily enough, the, the for the last ten films, we haven't sat down and spotted it. But that he he just mm. likes me to go and do it, and then he'll have lots to say, and he'll sort of say, "I, I, hate, I hate that there. What, what are you doing there?" And you know, taking he's joking. He's saying that, uh, or um, yeah. we're not. Uh, it shouldn't be here. It should be there. Uh, and I really thought there should be something there. But he wants to hear what I I do. And actually, we've got, I've got a music editor called JJ George, who's um, who's been doing all of those films with me and never missed one with Adam and he knows he and I know Adam pretty well so we will spot it together and I'll write and then Adam will comment on it um it's quite a good way to do it and actually I've been doing the temp really mostly on most of these films because I just because it you know it's so painful I mean uh to get to get too involved in temp especially with comedy stuff and there's always it's um so I get involved very early I write this by the time we do the first um, test screening, I've probably written three quarters of the score. Um, and, you know, Adam's signed it off. That's just ideal. It's great because it's because you don't have all that temp stuff that goes on that can be really destructive to you, you know. It's crazy how many movies he's he's churning out, though. I mean, one a year? That guy, what's his work ethic like? Is it is it hard to keep up at times? It seems like he's constantly going. He is, yeah. No, he's. I mean, I, I mean, just recently, though, I mean, people have recognised what a great actor he is. So I'm sure he's probably not going to be in as many. I don't know how he'll fit in, make having fun. I mean, he loves making the movies, apart from anything else, uh, with all his mates, and 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 um, we're very lucky that he, of his loyalty, you know. But um, I'm sure he's going to be he's going to be um, cast in some really interesting roles. And in fact, I know he has been. So um, that's going to take up some of his time. Um, doing all that well uncut gems was certainly showed a side of yeah. adam sandler that that you know was a revelation for many film goers that he could be that character yeah it, it was, was adam sandler but it was adam sandler the actor not adam sandler the, the silly comic and yeah. and i think that certain directors of course are thinking you know who could do this is adam sandler before we go rupert i do need to ask I know I asked you if you'd, you'd ever been to Rwanda. Have you ever been to Bristol? Yeah, to yes. The fabulous headquarters of Wallace and Gromit. I have. Yes, yes, I have. Because that was I actually uh, the reason I ask is when you're talking about how silly animation is. I once had a very strange trip down to meet Nick, who's one of the Wallace and Gromits, yes. and um, go to Aardvark Studios. And I found that to be, for those of you who see those films and know what we're talking about, Rupert worked on Curse of the Were-Rabbit. But those sets, which are in miniature, are so preposterously, amazingly stupendous, the little sets of towns and and scenarios and villages. And uh, I just wondered if you'd had a chance to walk into that room where they have those sets, because that was one of my favorite parts yeah, yeah. of the visit. Yeah, no, absolutely. Absolutely. And uh, after I'd worked on the film, I went, 
and uh, whatever it was called, Lordington Hall, and uh, and uh, and their house was was still all set up. And it's the detail is great. Um, they're all eccentric beyond eccentricity. I mean, they come from a part of England, um, certain part of Yorkshire up north that that is quite well known for people that are outspoken and quite eccentric, and they just bring that to their art and. Uh, it's fabulous. Yeah, it was really, really good fun. That that's another example of ridiculousness. I mean, if you if you can't have fun on writing on that movie and <laughs> and and just take it to you know eleven, then then you're in the wrong game, really. I have to share that I I flew overnight from Los Angeles to Heathrow to have a meeting at Wallace and Gromit Land about a movie. Um, I made a tragic error, which is I didn't sleep enough on the plane. I got off at. Heathrow, there was a car that drove me to Bristol. I was with a mate. We were going to go talk about a film. We got into a meeting with their staff in a big overheated conference room. And uh, at the end of the meeting, I, I said, oh, great meeting. And my friend turned to me and said, you know, you slept through the entire thing. <laughs> I didn't realize that my head had fallen on my chest and I had slept through the entire meeting. But then I did get to take the tour. Needless to say... We didn't make the deal because one of the people from 20th Century Fox had slept the entire hour in his chair. I didn't even know it. I'd fallen so sound asleep. It's one of the dangers of working in L.A. and London Robert, at the same time. Yeah, I'm, a, I'm afraid I did that. I, I got, I got uh, 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 many years ago, but I about 15, 20 years ago, I got shortlisted for a movie. I think it was between myself and Chris, Chris Beck, probably. And um, so I came, I flew all the way over for the meeting, got the car to the to, to uh, Disney, um, was shown into a room, met the director, talked about the movie. I'd read the script on the plane, and he said, well, "Let's sit down and we'll watch it." And they'd taken the, the temp music off it. And as you know, when 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 a film's sort of a little bit chubby anyway, because it's not finished, it's <laughs> two and a half hours long had no music. I hadn't slept on the plane. And uh, the next thing I knew, uh, I was getting a poke in the ribs by the director saying, Rupert, you know, clearly you didn't like it that much because <laughs> you've been snoring the last 20 minutes. And um, that was it. That was the end of the meeting. And uh, funnily enough, I didn't get the movie. Oh, that's um, so amazing. So it's are. good to know because I've had that happen with a composer. And I recently spoke about it. <laughs> a composer flew to LA from Germany for a big meeting we went to the producer's house we're sitting at his breakfast table he's very excited about this composer it's the three of us at breakfast and the composer is so clearly i, I don't know whether knackered is the word or just <laughs> completely exhausted and jet lagged that he's just having that conversation it's like yeah i'd like <laughs> do this and and it's clear that he can't hardly stay awake and afterwards the producer looked at me and said no way i said listen he's a great composer he's a great composer is all i can tell you but uh you know it's sort of i guess the 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 skill is to arrive a day early and sleep before that meeting don't show up yeah. from lax or heathrow yeah. and have your yeah no you, i audition. didn't do that again i never did that again that was uh, yeah. another. We've talked a lot of today about lessons learned, haven't we? Uh, yeah. That's another. <laughs> Good. I think we can. I think we could do a little book. Rupert's lessons for composing. I think the biggest lesson you might have shared, strangely enough, you'd be surprised if I brought this up, was about that script writing book. And if I think in subsequent weeks, mm. you can send me that title. I'd be interested to know and share that book because that is an incredibly valuable piece of advice that i've you know I, of course we're all in a position of telling young composers you know be nice in an interview uh only send two or three demos don't send an hour's worth of music uh you know all the things that we share go sweep floors at a studio for a year and make tea and be prepared to do anything before you get your first cue to write all those things that are fairly academic that we share I've never heard someone say, read a book on script writing, which I think yeah. is yeah. tremendous advice, really great advice. Yeah. Because what you're doing is, yeah. you know, Alfred Newman said at Fox, the composer is the last writer on a film. 
And I remember thinking that is so interesting. But if you, if Rupert, if you do find that book or the title, and I guess it could be any book on script writing, but that's a great tip. Yeah, no, I'll, 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 I'll look it out. I'll look it out. I don't have it anymore. I think I probably passed. I probably thought I was doing a great thing and passed it on to Chris Willis or, or, <laughs> or, or an assistant I had. And you, That's you great. mentioned um, that uh, you're working on something with Harry. Yeah. I- any other projects on, uh, on the fringe here coming up that you can tell us about? Yeah. Uh, Aquaman 2 is the shooting here in the UK, funnily enough. Nice. Um, so that will be a big, a big big operation there's always a lot of music and so i've already i have had um meetings with james and where you know i know i've read read the script a couple of times and i know what i've got to do so that and there's a, a couple of other things um on the on the periphery um but um yeah uh, aquaman 2 will be next year we didn't really touch on it but uh your aquaman score is was so just awesome i when i first heard it it threw me for a loop because of the synths that you mentioned. It just felt like it's underwater. This is such a cool idea, and it was so not what I was ex- I was expecting, just orchestra. And you got this synthy, really action-packed, and then the, 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 the love stories, and it just, it's really, well, that's, really good that's music. Kind of yeah. um, so we didn't get a chance to touch on it, but I'm definitely looking forward to, to more of that coming soon. So um, I think, uh, Robert, if you... Do you have any? I just want to say thank you. My final thoughts are thank you, um, Rupert. You're an elegant human being and extremely articulate. Two two things that are just benefits as a composer. Of course, people think it's all in the music, but I always say it's about also being able to communicate. And what a lovely conversation to have. I look forward to the Gilded Age, if only because the combination of talents of of you and Julian Fellows, and it just sounds, you know, so far he's batting a thousand, and I can't imagine how great that's going yeah. to be. I just really yeah. think that's exciting. And all your future work with Adam and uh, whoever comes next, I really appreciate your time. I wish I was in Southern England, but then again, people in Southern England wish they were in Southern California. So it all works out. But <laughs> You're right, Rupert, man. thanks so much. I know our fans are looking forward to hearing from you. Good so stuff. thank you, Rupert. We will run through really quick. A reminder to our listeners, uh, you can follow us. There's a number of ways. Twitter, at Score the Podcast. Instagram, at Score Movie. Facebook, Score a Film Music Documentary. Don't forget to sign up on Patreon to more Score, exclusive interviews, exclusive merchandise, stuff you won't get here on the show. And stick around after the show today. We're going to play you a clip from Spitfire Audio so you can hear some of the different sounds to help elevate your music. Rupert, thanks so much for coming on the show today. Thank you. Really appreciate it. Cheers. Bye now. Hey, SCORE listeners, we are grateful beyond measure for the support of Spitfire Audio. They collaborate with people like Hans Zimmer and the Bernard Herrmann Estate to build sample libraries that elevate your music. You're about to hear a musical demo of what that sounds like. Yes, and as an exclusive to you, our score listeners, you can save 25% off of your first order of Spitfire products using the promo code SCORE2021. Again, it's an exclusive to you, so don't don't post it on Reddit. Come on. Save it for you. Get your promo code. Get your deal. And check out this cue right now from one of their newest packages, Albion Solstice.
Again, just go to spitfireaudio.com. Use the promo code SCORE2021 to save 25% off your first order on any Spitfire packages, including Albion Solstice, which you just heard. Stick around with us. A couple more weeks, we'll be back with another episode of Score the Podcast. Thanks for listening. Thanks for watching. We'll see you soon. Peace out.